Hey, how you doing? This is John, and welcome to John's Long Box. I'm here with Mike Allred, one of my favorite Hello. comic book artists of all time. Thank you for coming. Thanks for having me. He's live from the Death Star. Look at those doors. <laughs> I, lo I love it. So I, I was reading up on you. That I, I see that I, I always thought that your first comic book that came, came uh, I can't even talk. I'm still fanboy gushing. I always thought that your first public comic was, was Mad Men, but you did a couple of things before Mad Men. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Graphics Illustrated is was the. And you, and you you did two series, right? I I I'm embarrassed yeah. that I, uh, first thing I first thing I had that came out uh, was Dead Air and Dead Air, yes. And I initially just wanted to do something that I could show my family. Look, I made this, and what I found was I was never satisfied. So I just kept doing something till I was satisfied, and I'm almost there. But my <laughs> <laughs> the next thing I did was uh, Graphic Music. We were living right. in Europe at the time. Uh, I was a reporter for AFRTS. And uh, I was sent all over Europe covering uh, mostly human interest stories. And the last story I did before uh, my hobby took off was uh, covering the fall of uh, their Berlin Wall and interviewing East German refugees. So, so and so then when we got back to the States, I restarted Graphique Music as Graphic Music. And then from there uh, in those pages, Almost simultaneously, I introduced Frank Einstein, almost simultaneously with the one shot called Creatures of the Id. Those were the uh, first appearances of Frank Einstein, who I then put a costume on, and he became Madman. So, uh, yeah, I, you started out as a reporter. You know, you, you, you didn't start out to become a comic book artist. You said this was your hobby that... You... I, didn't, I didn't have a clue how to... <laughs> Comic books have, have literally been in my life from my very first memory. And um, I figured you had to go to New York and, and yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, we didn't have the internet back then. We didn't have uh, uh, any, any way of really learning beyond what was available to us in school. And nobody was telling you how to be a comic book artist. So we did it for fun. Me, me and my older brother, we just did it for fun. Just whatever paper we had, we would make our own comics but never conceived of actually doing it until um, the indie boom in the mid to late eighties and a friend, uh, Charlie Custis giving me all of these comics showing me that the sky was the limit. There were no rules. You could do whatever you wanted. And I was uh, writing a screenplay called dead air and storyboarding it. Cause I, I, you know, I bought uh, movie magazines like Cine cinematique and uh, yeah. um uh, that sort of thing, but uh, Fangoria, but anyway, so I knew what storyboards were. So I was storyboarding my screenplay thinking that's how I could somehow get that made. And then I just fell head over heels in love with what was happening with comics. He gave me um, not that the, to give you an idea of exactly when this was, I think there were two more issues of Watchmen to come out. And he gave me those. He gave me all the Frank Miller Daredevils, oh, Dark Knights, and what. But what really skewed me was um, Mr. X and the first four issues, which were done by the Hernandez brothers. Oh and, yeah, were they great? Oh, oh man, God. I at, in Colorado Springs, where I was teaching um, television production at the time. I met Stephen Siegel, um, who was a very successful comic book writer. He co-created Big Hero 6 and, and uh, uh, Ben 10. But at the time, he had his very first comic out, Kafka. And he, so we became friends. And I t was telling him all the things that I was crazy about. And among those was Mr. X. And he said, if you like Mr. X, you will love Love and Rockets. Yeah. And being, being introduced to Love and Rockets, uh, just blew me away. There's a software update again. Any, everybody should know. I know I'm tech. Tech technology is not my friend. <laughs> okay, what is this? So I'm gonna. Okay, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> That's um, okay. I'm glad you brought up Mr. X because that is like an unsung legendary comic. And, and oh, I remember this page. I bought it okay. anyway. Yeah, at at uh, WonderCon in Oakland one year, he brought pages in and. And I was one, one among the this 
first little group of people that he broke them out and i was like mine <laughs> and just grabbed the first page and yeah, I, I, up I, over there my, my friend phil i forget, i don't know what it is he goes but you you got to get this mr x comic and he actually bought me the first issue and then because of that i've been a lifelong loving rockets oh and just, oh man such great comics i have everything even like they make a new collection i'll buy it again you know it's yeah. just if it has just one new cover one new pinup doesn't matter anything the Hernandez brothers do. I will get a night and I have yeah, to find out. I don't have it. I will move heaven and earth to get it. I, it's yeah. A real tough. I, 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 and I, also Terry Windsor Smith is like that for me too. It's funny that you said it. Cause I, I, I never was a big fan of Conan until just maybe like the past five, six years. So I've been buying the back issues of, of the Conan, the barbarian. I'm up, I'm up to a I see now why everybody loves Barry Windsor Smith. You know, the first couple of issues was like, him aping Jack Kirby, but he comes on to his own. And oh my God, it's within, beautiful. Within a 24 issue run, he goes, he develops into this completely unique, glorious master. It's yeah. amazing. And I, I have those on my spinner rack. They're never far from me. Though, and I mentioned those are the two. Oh, here, since you brought up spinner rack, there's my spinner rack. All right. And you can see you're on there. X ray, X ray <laughs> robots on there. Oh, look at that. That is awesome. <laughs> I, lo I love that room. Jeez. <laughs> For those of you who don't know, I'm in New York and he's over there on, on, on the other coast, you know. Eugene, Oregon. Eugene, oh, I didn't want to mention it. With it's, you know, but uh, that's up to you. But yeah. I, I just love this two people on the as far away as possible with like nerd comic book spinner racks talking. I, I don't know. Tech, I'm, not, I'm not a technology still, guy too, but still this. walk to each other, so we can be <laughs> further apart. But here we can at least still walk. Right, right, yeah. yeah. <laughs> this is this is awesome. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Those, those are the creators that. So I have a very long list of artists that have influenced me and mean the world to me. And, um, but those are the two entities that inspired me to actually seriously go about making my own professional comics. Those, those were what really got me off the, off the bench. Were, were, were you, uh, you know, uh, professionally trained? Are you just that, that kid that drew all the time? Did you go to school for, for art? I'm that kid that drew all the time. In fact, That's in awesome. junior high, um, I had a great art teacher who um, felt that his uh, assignments were too pedestrian for me and put an easel in the corner for me and 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 worked with me to create my own projects. And um, so he gave me that special attention and, and to, to nurture me further. Uh, and uh, so I'm very grateful for that because, yeah, the assignments were pretty ridiculous. Um for where I was at, because my dad and mom were they our house was he was a frustrated artist. He was a psychologist. Okay. Um, and uh, but very much wanted to be an artist. There was a drawing table in our house, and he had all the Andrew Loomis books, like figure drawing for all it's worth, that sort of thing. And me and my brother Lee would uh, copy the figures out of there and then draw superhero costumes on them, stuff like that. But we always had art supplies. We were never without the opportunity to make things. And uh, mom was always giving us projects, uh, uh, carving puppets, it's, uh, paper mache. Um, we're always, there was always new stuff, uh, ceramics. Mom was always uh, oh, wow. giving us stuff to, to, to work with and, and to create with. And uh, yeah, it, it's, it was huge. It was very important for our development. And yeah, so I was just like, I was that kid in the class that was always drawing in his notebook and, there, you could probably go to my old schools and and go in the library and see things that books I drew. <laughs> I, I took one art class in, in, in junior high school, and then the teacher told me, "Have you tried football?" <laughs> <laughs> I was, you know, I was a big kid in in in, in junior high school, but that's about it. <laughs> mm. uh, we said, I figured drawing for all it's worth. Uh, Shadow Punk, who has his own comic called Shadow Punk. I wonder if it, I wonder what it was like breaking into comics for you. Was it challenging creating your own style? Huh. Um, see, again, I didn't know how to go about it. So when um, uh, really it was Charlie Custis and Steve Siegel, who um, uh, were just throwing all the, the this stuff at me, um, and there, so massive 
reintroduction to comics in um, the late 80s. And uh, with that, Steve, his first book was published by Renegade Press, who would have been my first publisher, but Denny Luber, the publisher, quit, um, but had solicited it. And uh, so I, it was like, uh, do you remember Amazing Heroes? Oh, yeah, yeah. It was uh, that that would have little reviews in the back of and it was, you know, they were constantly uh, because of the success of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. There are all these indie books that were popping up. So from there, um, you would get you would get their addresses and you could submit your stuff directly to these publishers. Eclipse, um, Kamiko. Yeah, Kamiko uh, first. You know, yeah. right. Yeah. These so all great oh my, there was important comic book companies. I remember I, I got obsessed with with Eclipse and First and Comic Co. You know, I got tried, and I still try to get everything by those companies because comic book people are crazy people. We know that. <laughs> well, so I stumbled into it because of the indie boom, and when um, Denny Denny had solicited Dead Air, and then quit, and we were off in Europe at the time. Fortunately, Dan Vado of Slave Labor Graphics had seen the solicitation and wanted to know what had happened. Knew Denny, contacted me to say, hey, um, what, what's going on with this? And I was like, well, it's all done. It was 100 pages. Denny was going to release it in four chunks. And Dan was like, well, I'll publish it. And it's all done. All I have to do is solicit it, collect it as a graphic novel. And so that was my first work. And then from there, Steve Siegel had made a proposal for uh, something uh, us to create together called Jaguar Stories and sold it to Kamiko. And this was a 12 issue series with a generous page rate. And that's what justified me quitting my broadcasting career, moving back to the States and doing Jaguar Stories full time. So I, I had a whole year guaranteed of work. Well, once we got back to the States, Kamiko went chapter 11. Yeah. And I was flailing. And, but in that time, people, I, what I really love about the comic book industry is how supportive your peers are. And, and everybody's a fan, you know? And so there, there was just a lot of people like Matt Wagner and Neil Gaiman um, who, who were just like, oh, I'll, I'll introduce you to this. I'll, I'll see what they think, you know? And, and, and so that continued. So in this period, Laura was our, our breadwinner. She was the manager of a jewelry store and allowed me to just keep plugging away, trying to get something going when the, the bottom dropped out of Kamiko. But again, uh, people had heard about this stuff and were curious about it. And it's funny how many times that has happened, um, even fairly recently, where somebody will have just heard about something and just had to know, had to know, and would be very supportive. But ultimately what happened was um, because I was, I didn't know how to get my foot in the door with the big two. I just kept creating my own stuff and madman, uh, you know, um, uh, Kevin Eastman, um, Teenage Ninja, Ninja Turtles, if not for their success, I'd probably still be in broad or would have gone back to broadcasting because he formed a publishing entity called Tundra and I met him in San Francisco. I had, uh, I had made a fake comic book cover of Madman and it even made t-shirts. When we, we started going to shows, we made t-shirts and that pay, we sold way more t-shirts that t-shirts kept us going people. Cause you know, you can, go somewhere and you may not know what the comic book is, but if you see a cool t-shirt, you buy the cool t-shirt with the red lightning bolt on it with the, this, you know. this was a uh, madman's face. It was actually called the spook at the time. And it, it was glow in the dark. Oh, so it was wow. a glow in the dark face on a black shirt. And we sold everyone we had, but it also sold it to Kevin Eastman and madman. Uh, we changed the name to madman. I was reading catcher in the rye at the time and Holden Caulfield is madman, this madman, that and I thought, that why has nobody used a character called Madman? So I did, and <laughs> uh, and Kevin was very generous with the marketing, and um, people like Ann Egan, his marketing director, uh, got uh, Alan Moore to to blurb it, 
And so just stuff like that, where people yeah. always just, there was always just, or like Frank Miller and the, the legend guys inviting me into that group. And all of a sudden I was the, who's that guy? So there was a legend tour and you, we all had stuff to sign and people would come and there'd be a table for all of us. I was the guy, nobody knew who he was, but it made people curious. And it just, uh, I see it Frank Miller, <laughs> yeah, um, Jeff Carroll, Mike Mignola, Art Adams, John Byrne. Uh, legend, every one of these people. The, the night guy must be a legend too. I got to get to know him. That's the thing. Here I'm sitting with these literal legends. And so it made people curious and it just put a spotlight on me that I wouldn't have had otherwise. Yeah, well, and, the, uh, and it's just kind of people incredible. are all fans. You know what I mean? Like Frank Miller is a big fan of comic books. And Alan Moore, there's a famous picture of him gushing shaking hands with Jack Kirby. You know, it's like the only time you don't see Alan Moore with that bravado, you know what I mean? And then he's like, yeah. hold, you know, so yeah. So when they see your artwork, they, they, turn, they become fans, you know? Yeah. And it, it, it's something unique about our industry because it, in, in many cases you can boil down the creative entity to one or two or three individuals. You, you can be a, like, I'm a big fan of uh, Kubrick or David Lynch um, but when, except for these auteurs, you say Wes, Wes Anderson, you, you, most people will look at a film. They have no idea who is behind it. It's very rare to have an individual that is, you know, largely the sole creator or the main driving force of it. And then of course there's the, uh, the, you have to build a village to make a movie. You know, you need a cast, you need a crew. Yeah. And with the, with a comic book, you can, um, like you, you can meet somebody who wrote a whole series or drew a whole series, or in my case, wrote and drew a whole series. And, or then you could be a big fan of a colorist. Like there are people who may not like my stuff, but they love Laura's coloring. <laughs> I, I, I will say Laura is one of my favorite colorists. So yes, I am a fan of a colorist, but I'm also a fan of your art, you know, and I, I just love when you two work together. It's, again, I, I say this before we went live, my wife is not into comic books. She tolerates me being into comic books, but she loves your work and she loves Laura's colors. She says, she goes, it's just happy. It makes me feel good. Well, we're happy. We are yeah. in a happy place and we do I'm not good. take anything for granted. We know how lucky we are. We know that any, any kind of life or career in entertainment is a crapshoot. You could be crazy talented and no, and just never get seen, never get yeah. heard. And so we're very grateful for everybody that made sure we got seen and heard because we live a wonderful life and and we just do not take it for granted. That is awesome. That is that is that's you have a good attitude. You have a good attitude. Uh, Tony Grigo is asking, "What's your opinion on the G-Men from Hell film?" Oh, I love it. <laughs> I, I love it too. <laughs> it was uh, um, you know a super low budget. Uh, Christopher Coppola. Uh, Francis's nephew directed it. Nicholas Cage's older brother. In fact, Nicholas Cage was almost Cheetah Man, but he he, oh. he he couldn't fit it in his schedule. Oh man, because he's such a comic book freak too. That would have been awesome. Yeah, huge. And so, did you meet him? No, but oh. hung out with. I uh, met, spent a lot of time with Christopher and uh, and and the cast. We were we. I, I did a cameo towards the end of the film and. Uh, everybody was just super nice and generous and and uh, and it was really wonderful to see what they could squeeze out of uh, a you know a very low budget. You know, Bobcat Goldthwait was got turned into a robot. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm blanking on the actor's name is the sweetest man. He was the uh, rich Lebowski and the big Lebowski character actor that's in a zillion movies. Oh yeah, why can't I yeah. He plays Dr. Buffard. Um, yeah, I can't think of his name too, but yes, yes. Oh, uh, um, so hopefully somebody's out there, you know, IMD being him right now. But and, and Mark, the moderator will come up with his name. Such a sweet that. man. Everybody was was just the best. And uh, but and so then we had the premiere at uh, Sun uh, San Diego in 2000. And it was that same year that uh, James Gunn had his uh, the specials. Uh, uh, movie uh which he had written so i met him for the first time and you know uh so got to watch his entire career explode 
but we were both there pr premiering these films. And uh, I love that movie too. That's well, another fun it was, movie. It was on our anniversary. It was uh, so it was this huge celebration celebrating the film, the a packed theater, and uh, everybody there loved it, enjoy, enjoyed it, appreciated the fact that uh, the money was on every penny was on the screen, <laughs> and um, and it was our anniversary, so it was a big big celebration. And uh, but yeah, I mean. It, it you know it's it, it's what it is it's this weird little indie comic yeah. book movie I, I remember watching it and i was like this it's a fun movie you know and they did you know they they made the best of of, of a tiny budget you you yeah. know I, I thought they were pretty clever with it i i liked it you know um and another comic that you that i absolutely love i know you didn't write it but i zombie man i i i got that just because your artwork you know i if, if you make a comic I'm a fanboy. That means I just buy it sight unseen, and I don't like to read previews of stuff that I know that I'm going to get because they they ruin it. And I got Eye Zombie, and I was charmed by it. Now, it was it didn't run its course if I remember correctly. It was it canceled too soon? Oh no it it has a big epic conclusion, I, and I, um, it's it is epic. When we were doing the TV show, we were constantly trying to uh, integrate the other elements of horror. Um, the you know expanding the genre beyond the zombie thing, but uh, we can never kick that door down. But even but having said that, I again everybody on the TV show fantastic, super happy for Rose MacGyver's success. She's now on the number one uh, network sitcom with uh, Ghosts, um, and all five uh, seasons. If anybody wants to see I Zombie, all five seasons are on Netflix, and uh, yeah, that's the last. That, I, I loved seeing that, I, and I, of course, I illustrated and Laura colored the uh, the, the theme show introduction to the, to it, um, which was crazy fun. Um, but if you read the the comics, it all takes place in Eugene. Right. And you can take the the collection and walk through Eugene and go, that's there, that's there, that's there. And then with the TV show, it was decided that there weren't enough murders because we, it was going to be a procedural, uh, like the murder of the week kind of thing right, that, yes. that, that our protagonist has to solve by eating a brain. <laughs> and, and was, like, I don't want to watch this. I was like, no, it's, it's based on a comic that I love. <laughs> uh, but it was it was decided there weren't enough murders in Eugene. So uh, we moved the location to Seattle and talk about, again, Rose, praise for Rose. Every every episode, she would get to be a different person, and it just really showed her range. That's got to be a dream for an actress, right? You get to do yeah. something different every week. Yeah, I, and then I, we I, won this. Uh, we won this MTV Fandom Award, so I uh, got that in the other room, and we got to be at this big award show. And uh, yeah, the, with all the most of the cast was there. It was it, it it was a great ride. We had a lot of fun and. Chris Roberson, my co-creator on that, and Shelley Bond, who I have to mention, who it wouldn't have happened if she didn't get Chris and I together. So there was a lot of wonderful things that happened because of iZombie. I, I, in the comic, I, I just love the way you, they explored like the nature of, of, of werewolves and, and go, I thought it was so clever. Yeah. You know, like when, when I was reading Anne Rand, not Anne Rand, Anne Rice, excuse me, when she was explaining the nature of a vampire, I loved all the fake history. And yeah. The, yeah. So I, I was like, oh my God, like, because I just happened to be reading Anne Rice at the same exact time. I was like, this, this is like a comic book version of like an exploration of where the werewolves come from. And then one guy was, 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 was a were Jack Russell Terrier. I thought that was great. Yeah, <laughs> that was a yeah we, we, they, they kind of hinted at stuff like that in, in the show. We, uh, but, one one element, uh, my uh, both Laura and I, our favorite element in the comic was her best friend was Ellie the ghost, and really really thought we, that would have been great if we could have brought that into the TV show, but it never happened. Uh, and uh, you you also one, one of my favorite comics was 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 the Atomics. Oh my God! Like Thanks. What, what I I used to when I was. For the longest time, whenever I would get comics, I'd put the comics that I liked on the bottom of the pile to force myself to read. <laughs> and, and then next thing you know, the pile is getting bigger and bigger, and I'm always reading bad comics. So, like, somewhere around the age of 45, I'm like, I could die tomorrow. And I reversed it. And I read all the – so the Atomics was always the first, like, Usagi Yojimbo, the Atomics, those were always the first comics I read every month. 
I, I, I remember there was one exchange with a, Oh God, now I'm going to embarrass myself that I can't remember the, the guy who would swap powers and he would transform. And you had this like logical equation of transforming back and forth. And I remember I was actually like mathing it out. I'm like, Mark Allred is just as a compulsive person as I am. This is awesome. It's, it was so satisfying that you figured out the logical transformation process of these two characters. <laughs> <laughs> I really like. Uh, I, I I really really liked it. It girl, how how is there not like a, a continuing series of it girls? She was such there a was. Fast- we did it. Oh, I'm talking 100, 300 issues, like going on like yeah. Superman for the I next seven years. 20, 20 some issues, I think, but. But no, um, yeah, and Mike Mignola said uh, that it, she was comic book's cutest character. Yeah. Uh, I always take, I will always be thrilled with that compliment. I, I'll, I'll say you and Josh Howard draw the cutest girls, hands down. Oh, I, you know, <laughs> you're the top two of my favorite. Oh, you know, I, I don't know what it is, but you draw. And then again, you, you draw these big, beautiful eyes. They're just so cute and adorable. Yeah, so It Girl was... I have Laura to look at all the time, so she inspires <laughs> all the female characters. <laughs> that's great. That's great. And we, hello, Nick. Good to see you, Nick, is in the chat. Uh, that's right. Was, was Steve Buscemi in it also? He was in G-Men? For... No, no. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Wayne Newton had an appearance. No, uh, um, mm, uh, Robert Goulet. Robert Goulet, I always get those two mixed up. Yeah, was, I'm embarrassed to myself in front of Mark Ellerin. Yeah, he's the devil. But I was in I was in Spy Kids two with Steve Buscemi. Does that count? Oh, that's what he's that's what he's that's why I was confused. I'm like, it wasn't in the movie, but uh, I doubted myself. And I, I Bill Paxton was in that. Um, my gosh, uh, Richard Linkletter, Cheech. Uh, we we shared a trailer with Cheech on the set. It was it was awesome. So how did how did you how did you wind up in Spy Kids two? Buddies with Robert Rodriguez, he optioned Madman for like 14 years. He optioned it. We tried to tried to crack the code and and make a Madman movie happen, uh-huh. but we finally figured out that uh, we just couldn't squeeze enough into a two hour theatrical film. So now we're kind of resetting, and now with streaming and stuff, a series makes a lot of sense. But um, you know, it's, it's hard to line the planets up, but anyway, a lot, of, again, a lot of wonderful things happened there with Robert, uh, all of his friends who had kids, he, he flew them into, um, he flew them into Austin to be spy kids. So our little girl, Kelby was a spy kid and spy kids too. Well, that's cool. <laughs> that, that's something fun. Oh, uh, we, we have a question. What kind of pencil do you use in, in ink and brush? Oh, I use a uh, Pentel clicker pencil. Uh, uh, point zero and a, and a, a super soft lead. Um, and if I, if I really want to keep it clean, I'll use a harder, harder lead. So, but, um, I quickly realized that I wouldn't have to use a pencil sharpener if it breaks, click, click, click. Oh, it's always there. It has the twist eraser on the end. So I bought a whole bunch of those when that became my favorite pencil. And, um, of course it's just a tiny step towards, finishing it, which is the ink. And um, I used to be a, a total devotee to Windsor and Newton and my, uh, either the Sable Series 7. And w- would use, I started out with uh, Higgins Black Magic, but their formula watered down. So I started mixing it in with uh, Speedball Super Black. But then Joe Quinones turned me on to a Japanese cartridge brush pen i'll be right back i i, I always find this fascinating because i know nothing about this and it, 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 it might as well be alchemy when, when when artists talk about the lead in the pencil and mixing the inks and stuff uh i know there's a couple of artists in the chat like do, do you relate to this do you mix and match your your, your inks and your pencils you know I, I and, and i find out that i really enjoy watching people draw stream on on, on youtube it's very relaxing so I've, I've used every tool, like I'd be at the art supply store, you know, you'll see the little scraps of paper there and you'll try this and you'll try that and you'll, all these different markers, whether they're the, I mean, I could just go through all the, all of them, but, but it would be pointless because I don't use any of them, any of them anymore. The Faber-Castell pit pen is the marker that I use. I can, the XS, I can do these really tiny, tiny controlled little marks with that. I should have grabbed one of those when I was over at my workstation, but uh this is um, the the pencil, 
And then Joe Quinones, um, one of my best buds in the biz, he, I, I saw him using one of these at a show. And I was like, what's that? And he says, oh, this is great. And, you, and he gave me one. And it's a, um, it's a Japanese brush pen. And it has a, a really great tip. Oh, yeah. And, um, and then you screw these cartridges on and it's the best ink I've ever, I've ever used it. it it's so rich and black and, and perfect. Now, I, if I had started out trying to learn how to ink with a brush with this first, I would have been very frustrated. But after years and years and years, after going through dozens of sable brushes, um, I mastered the skill to figure out how to make this work, and um, it changed my life. It, uh, it, it's I don't have to dip into an inkwell anymore. I don't have to worry about the 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 tips splitting. Which the 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 Windsor Newton brushes are so expensive. And um, you can spend all this money on it, take it home, and then pfft, it splits and it just be so frustrating. So I think it was, I think it was Bill Stout who, um, like, name dropping these uh, my famous comic book friends. That's okay. Um, <laughs> um, or it might have, or it might have been Charles Vess. But <laughs> no, anyway. Um, that Steve Ditko, and he said to me. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what Steve, Steve Ditko said to me. But anyway, uh, he, uh, no, it was uh, Bill Stout. Um, he said, what you want to do is ask for a little, ask for water at the store, uh, put the brush in the water, and then slap it against your arm. And if it splits, don't buy it. And so I, I did that for a while. But again, I swear, this thing has changed my life. Uh, it, it just, I, it increased my pro productivity massively. So to answer that question, all of these other tools that I've used, gone, that's all I need. And how long does a pen last? You said that's... The, the, I, I, these are, I have some that have lasted for years, and when they do when they do wear, I use those for dry brushing te uh, textures. Oh, that's, that's um, But yeah, they're really great. I'll have, uh, I, I have a little Darth Vader tin with a sponge in it, a little just so it's a little wet, and and I'll just kind of run this across it when I need to get a fine point on it, and uh, it just works. It it works. So I, I, you know, we were talking before we went live that you, you said you're notoriously difficult with technology. So I, I assume you draw on paper still. Yeah. I should, I should have surrounded myself with stuff to show off. Okay, it's okay. <laughs> you know, are you are you not interested in digital drawing? Oh, I'm very interested. Okay. Um, and that's why I'm doing this is because I don't want to get left behind. I want to learn. I'm eager to learn, but I do fall back on what you know brought me here. Yeah, what works. Yeah. Yeah, but no, I'm I'm constantly like one thing I found uh, digitally that um, I'm excited about is there's a program that will uh, make your panel borders. Um, so like you can, um, you can uh, it, it just instantly makes your panel borders and then you can print out the bristle board and you've got your panel borders there perfect, like perfectly spaced and stuff like that. So there's thing, there's def, I'm always looking for any way to, um, you know, to make my stuff better, more consistent, um, and make what I enjoy most more fun because the heavy lifting is taken care of because putting ink on paper, there's nothing more satisfying for me. That's that, that's that last step. And then Laura and I created a process where, um, she will scan my line art and then give me it back. And then I'll do tones, graphite tones or gray washes to do my modeling it's where I'm deciding where the shadows and stuff are. And then when she scans it again, she can turn um, this additional layer, this additional into a, a, any color she wants. And so you'll see a lot, a, a lot of times when you see the color on the page, it looks organic. You'll see the texture of the paper, of the brush, of, of the way the uh, tones, whether it's again, graphite or gray wash, you'll see how they lay and, and it's subtle but it gives it a more handmade 
organic look rather than a digital computer look. Yeah, uh, Lord, I, I'm kind of blown away that that she colors digitally because it looks so old school. And know? again, she started old school when when she started out. She had to do the thing where where she would um, uh, you'd get a photocopy of the black and white art, and she would use Dr. Martin dyes or watercolors and watercolor a you know a little page, and then she would have to draw a line of every individual color off to the side and there'd be a color chart that she would have to write the code down and then that would get sent in. And this is when we had to send our original art in too. So we'd send our pages in, they would photograph it we'd, and then she'd send her color guides in and then wherever it went, somebody would do the separations and have to, and that's how they would, she would have to be very careful about, yes, this is the color I want because you wouldn't get to see what it looks like because what she's painting doesn't look like what the color she's coding, you know, it's, it'd be close, but she would have to look and, and cause you, it would be this flip through thing and it'd be this color and this color. It was so involved when we got our first computer and she was first shown. In fact, it was the folks at dark horse. They had their own, they were the first publishers to have their own in-house colorists. And that dark horse is just like an hour and a half from us. Oh, so okay. we, we would go up there and they took the time to show Laura. This is when we were doing Madman comics at dark horse. And they took the time to show Laura how to do it, what computer to buy, what programs to use. And so we got our first Mac and uh, Photoshop. And I, I remember she would uh, save a page and there'd be a blue bar that would just take five, <laughs> five minutes. You just to save it. And, and you would have to save constantly because if you didn't, if, if something crapped out or if there was a power surge or something, everything she did would be gone. And there were a lot of frustrating moments like that. And that first computer cost us more than probably every computer we bought since. It was insanely expensive, but we had, you know, Universal had bought the rights, uh, the option rights, not the full rights to Madman. Anyway. So we we were like, let's do this. Let's let's make let's set you up so you can be independent in this way. And and for her to not have to draw, she loved painting. You know, doing the watercolor things. And I miss that seeing these beautiful watercolored little uh, color guides. But to have to draw a line from every single different color and mark what the code was for the color. She does not miss that at all. <laughs> it sounds tedious. It's, oh, yeah. so, you know, see, hearing how the sausage is made sometimes is, is is fascinating because this is stuff I don't know. You know. Yeah. I I remember a a, a story of uh, it 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 was Barry Windsor Smith, I think it was who, when he first started working at Marvel, he's like, yeah, I'll color, I'll do whatever you want, and he did. You know, he was just lying to get the job, and he was watching other people call and he was one panel coloring the whole panel next panel and mary went where he went to smith goes you know it'd be a lot easier if you did all the blues on the page and then went back to all he's like i i, I knew that i was just you know oh of course you, you know, she, knew, she knew he was bluffing but you know i i love hearing stuff like that the all, yeah. all fun stuff yeah, and he became quite an innovator too before the the you know you, you'll see like uh, uh the comics that he colored himself it, when he would he, he worked less and less, which was just heartbreaking because it was always thrilling whenever he would do something. Yeah, but it was an event. He would see a, a new Barry Windsor Smith comic come out, and it was almost like a fill-in artist on something, and he would be the colorist, and it would just look different right. than everything else. He figured out what he had to do to get through that chain and have it look better than your typical comic book coloring, which I remember you know, he did a, uh, an X Men comic. It was I was a kid, so I think it was the first time I was exposed. And I I don't think I knew who Barry Windsor Smith was, but something told me that this was important. Yeah, you know, I was, I, it was like one of the first comics I put in a bag and board. Like this, this is important. You know? Yeah, you, you like there there's a um, a Daredevil, what just one issue of Daredevil he would do. And then for whatever reason, the cover ended up being a cover for something else. And then the interior didn't have his cover on it. So anyway, but he, yeah, he would do it every once in a while. Bam, there he is on X-Men. Bam, there he is on Iron Man. You know, I just like, yeah, but so you'd have to like 
and you know keep your ear to the grapevine and and know when this stuff was happening i, and, I also read that he when he came to new york to do conan he was homeless. He yeah. he drew the first couple issues of Coleman basically living on a on a park bench. Hey, yeah. This is this is when he was still trying to be Jack Kirby. Yeah, look at that. But see, I I this is the kind of thing I just have to have it. And he, I, I love that you could just reach over and pull out a piece of classic yeah. comic book history. Well, just <laughs> like the Hernandez brothers, uh, I think I have everything Barry Windsor Smith has ever published, and if I don't, I I'll if and find out I don't, I will do everything I can. But we're all like that, right? Like if we're right. we're all, you know, fans and we get obsessive about the things that we love and we just have to have it. Yeah. And, like I, I found out there's a comic by you that I don't have. And now I want to know what when's Jaguar Tale is going to come out. Never. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Steve and I, Steve and I have played with the idea of uh resurrecting it somehow. Um, I think I I think I penciled five issues. Um, before oh. it, the rug got yanked from underneath us, and um, I threw I threw a lot of stuff away just out of frustration, and it was stupid. But I but it was it was a super low point. It really it really was, and there were there were two very key low points where I had to figure out what I was made of and just how how devoted I could be to this art form. And I'm happy to be on the other side of that. You had a, a, a big run with, with Marvel, which I was a big fan of, of your Ecstatics and and, and uh, the Silver Surfer comic. And, and the, FF, uh, and FF, FF I, I love that. First off, Fantastic Four are my favorite all-time comic book property. And then- I'm your, here. I'm like, I'm so desperately hopeful that this movie is good. <laughs> I, I've been. I, I feel like a, a a battered girlfriend. Next time it'll be better, you know. <laughs> yeah. Oh well, Matt Shackman is fantastic. Um, so I'm the director. Every all the puzzle pieces are coming together nicely. Huge Pedro Pascal fan. Um, so uh, very hopeful, very optimistic that that this. I'm managing my expectations. I'll yeah. just leave it at that because I, I, I would. I would. I always would say that you know they got to start it in the '60s. It's got to be in the '60s, and then when they did Captain Marvel in the '80s, I thought that's that's what you do because nobody's talking about um, the Fantastic Four in any of these other Marvel films. So have them in the '60s, establish right. themselves, and then go off somewhere and come back the way Captain Marvel did. Th so this anyway. is what I said. It writes itself. They start in the 60s. They have that Mad Men aesthetic. Not Mad Men, your comic, but Mad Men, the TV show aesthetic. Yeah. They go off at the space. Doctor Doom, they battle Doctor And then they go off at faster than light speed, come back. And they still people from the 60s now. And yeah. Like, oh, my the God, you were those guys? That my I think it right. Anything else is wrong. I'm telling you right now, Marvel. Anything else you do is wrong. <laughs> or no, often uh, a dimension, you know, uh, running into a nihilist or something like yeah, that. Yeah, they're in the negative zone, and time works different or something. Absolutely. Yeah. There's yeah. there's so many ways they can do that. So fingers crossed. I, I, or, or they're battling Kang, and Kang brings. You know what I mean? This. Yeah. They, but the Jack Kirby run on Fantastic Four, absolutely by far and away my favorite run on comics. Is that so good? It's so deep, and think yeah. about all of the of the uh, characters, classic characters the that humans, Black world. Panther. I mean, it goes on and on and on. Uh, uh, Adam Warlock, for crying out loud, you yeah. know, it's people forget that. You know, Agatha yeah. Harkness, that's now popular on TV, all came out of yeah. the mind of Jack and Stan. Yeah, yeah, know, well, and Silver Surfer, 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 but my you know. absolute favorite Silver Surfer, completely solely created by Jack Kirby, as proven when Stan. Stan was on uh, record saying he received the pages. Who's this white guy on a surfboard? <laughs> so, and then Jack had to explain, well, Galactus should have a Herald. Right. So, so there should be no argument there. You know, of course, Stan gave him the Shakespearean gravitas, but, uh, but yeah, that was, Stan, that was Jack's complete idea. I, my second favorite Marvel run is, is the Jack and Stan Thor, you know, another great run like if you read thor from 150 to i'll say 200 oh my god there's, there's hardly a miss in, in that entire run it's how did those guys make all those great comics in right. such a short period of time well it's like the beatles. look yeah. at all the amazing thing the beatles did in such a short period of time that's stan and jack and and, I, and i'll catch hell for this but i think once the beatles broke up 
they were still geniuses, but it wasn't as good. It, it, I it was like chemistry. chemistry. Yeah, it was it's like salt and it's, it's the same with Stan and Jack. I mean, I yeah. love New Gods. I love it, but uh, and, and so much. But there's there's that little bit of chemistry that's missing. Right. It's it. I I think it's like the dialogue was a little bit off. You know. You know. Yeah, I think but Stan had more we're, of an. We're, we're nitpicking here, but but the, we're talking about masterpiece, right? And 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 humble masterpieces, <laughs> right? right. Yes, yeah, yeah, we're to, we're talking nitpicks between giants. You know, we're not. To, you know, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I don't need angry emails, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I, I and it, it it's funny because when I first got into comics, you know, I it, it was seventy four is is always the age that. Uh, the year that I give for when I got hardcore to comics, and at that point I was Marvel guy. So Jack Kirby was 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 at DC. He was only a couple of years later that he would come back to Marvel. So when you said Marvel Comics to me, you it was John Romita Senior. It was you know uh, John Buscema, and that was Marvel Comics. Like almost if I close my eyes and think about old Marvel Comics, those are, are and then Jack Kirby was that guy that like the older people liked. You know, I, I I didn't like him, and then as I got into high school, I, I worked at a comic book store, and the guys were like, "Oh, Jack Kirby and blah blah blah," and Will Eisner. I'm like, "Who who are these people?" And I started to pretend that I liked them because you know you didn't want to be left out of the conversation. And then I don't know what it was. One day I was just like, "Jack Kirby's the best." Like I, I you know, and I'm like a fanatic about it. I, you know, if you don't like Jack Kirby, it's almost like it's it's like saying you don't like comics. <laughs> well. Yes, I I understand. Like uh, some sometimes uh, his work just isn't aesthetically beautiful, and you'll it, you'll need like a Joe Sinnott or or a Dick Ayers to kind of come in and make it pretty, you know. But um, there's a power there, and I think once people kind of get that, there's no yeah. turning back. And and uh, but I understand it. I I don't. Fortunately, it's not my problem. I I completely love and uh, appreciate Jack Kirby in every way, but I understand the um, the resistance to it, As, especially younger people that, that like grew up with like Image Comics or something like that, where everything was, you know, super pretty. Because you know, I remember the, some of the old older guys in, in the uh, comic shop to be like, "Oh, Jack Kirby with sausage fingers," and the women weren't pretty, mm -hmm. you know. And I'm like. You hurt my feelings, guys. <laughs> and that would depend on the inker too, because you know, um, some he, he anyway, we, we could get into real yeah, we could geek out about this. This is fine. <laughs> I'm loving Will Leisner. Um I did a, a spirit story for the new adventures, yep. and uh I did it with my buds uh, Michael Avon Oming and Matt Brundage, and Will chose our story to do the cover. Nice. And that's what that is. Will, um, I actually, we met him in Germany before I had anything ever published. He was in, in Europe promoting a, a documentary called Comic Book Confidential. And um, when we met him, he he was thrilled because we spoke English and he'd been surrounded by Germans who didn't speak very good English. So it was fun for him to have a conversation. And I had dead air pages with me and he gave me feedback. And then um, after the soon after that, year after year, we would be at San Diego Comic Con and see him, and he he marked our progress, and he always promised to do a Madman um, pinup for us, and uh, never happened, but oh. that happened. So I I, I was uh, I at least was thrilled to see that uh, we at least had that professional connection. Oh, somebody in the chat asked a question, and I was waiting for a good time to bring it up. Uh. How, what are your feelings on, on Freakazoid? I, the cartoon. Do you, do you think that they? I I'm a live and let live guy, you know. Um, but fact, one of the main a animators, a very famous animator, um, told me, uh, dude, they they have your comics open, and they're they're wow. being encouraged to pull from your stuff, and um, I. Uh, just well, it, and should I do something about that? I mean, what, 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 what? What's you know, and yeah. what you and doing? he was he was like, I don't know. And so, uh, I actually wrote a letter to Steven Spielberg, who was the uh, uh, um, executive producer or 
so somewhere along the line it was his uh it was under his umbrella um and uh i didn't get a answer but did end up going to amblin for uh some madman related stuff at uh, at one point and at that point i was like let it lie <laughs> just just leave it alone and uh, cuz it, it's the kind of thing that's it's uh it's close enough to to uh feel a little violated yeah but also distant enough that i don't want to be petty and and uh squirmy about it and uh so i'm i'm at peace with it let's say that but but it is a fact that my work influenced that so if anybody ever thinks that that came first it absolutely did not oh, no yeah, I, I didn't realize it was that that they were doing that. I, 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 I got to admit, I was like, this is, you know, but I knew Madman first. I was like, this, this is a blatant ripoff. And I'm like, well, maybe it's a coincidence. I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's, it, there's, there's, there's recognizable similarities. <laughs> yes. But again, you know what? Life's too short, and so I'm, I'm, I always just swing into whatever is going to bring joy and and. Uh, That's good for you then and making tomorrow better than today. So that's what's kept me sane. Just so, try to keep karma on my side. So I, I noticed that you, you got the guitar up and we were talking a little bit that you, that you do play music, but music seems to be a theme throughout your comics. You, you know, you had a, you just did the, the David Bowie comic and you had the, I'm, I know I'm going to say the title wrong and I got the books right behind me, Red Rocket 7. You got it right. Oh, okay. I, I was so nervous. I was so nervous. Yeah. So. I, I take it you are a big music fan. Huge, I mean, absolutely. And music, uh, I think I think my creative process is musical in comics. Like I'm constantly thinking of timing and pace and rhythm. Um, it's it's very much a part of my creative process. And with Red Rocket Seven, um, that again brought a lot of wonder wonderful things. It's 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 the history of rock and roll told through the eyes of an alien clone, and uh, David Bowie saw it was a fan of it actually wrote a lyric in uh new killer star about it and um and uh anyway it it was uh huge it was just it just i would just encourage people to follow their heart um let their creative juices flow and um it brings it can bring happiness uh even if even if you're the only person that ever sees what what you create it does it does give you uh, kind of a sense of self and centers and put your feet firmly somewhere in this weird universe, which shouldn't exist, but does. Now, do, do you prefer being the writer artist or do you like working with writers? Do you have a preference? Two different entities. I love it. both. love them both. For me, I learn more with my collaborations. I feel more stretched out in a good way and a good healthy way with the collaboration. So it'd be really easy for me to just uh, uh, pull back and be very reclusive. And I, I have been that. I can imagine uh, that commonality with comic creators. It's a solo activity if you're writing, drawing and everything. Yeah. yeah. So I like, I, I like the interaction where I'm thinking of things that I wouldn't have thought of otherwise. Um, like, for instance, with Mark Russell and doing uh, Superman Space Age and now Batman Dark Age and all the other things we talk about doing in the future, um, it, it's, I, I the, sorry for bloviating this, but oh, totally I, we were talking yeah. about um, creators together, a chemistry working that isn't there when they're separate. And so it's a Lennon McCart McCartney thing, right? It's like... Right everything they did together they spurred each other on and that i i get that vibe with mark for instance i got it from fraction i got it from dan slout um the, the, so it and my older brother lee the like uh we did a series called bug it's it's my new god's dream book um if in fact if there's nothing else that comes from this for anybody interested in hearing me yak away check out bug it's one of my favorite things i've ever done and it was like a childhood dream come true for my brother and i and it's us tapping into 
not just uh, Kirby's new gods, but we tied a bone on a, a, a bow. <laughs> we tied we tied a bow on several stories that he started and never finished. Yeah, you never got to finish. Yeah, a lot like uh, Omac, uh, the uh, Dead Man Robot. Um, it's just pow pow pow. I love that book so much. It's in a beautiful little trade paperback. Um, seek it out if you haven't. I I'm so I think it's some of the best stuff I've ever done. But I will also say, I really think Batman Dark Age is the best thing I've ever done. Oh, wow. I'm just, I love hitting the drawing table. I love the the pages that are flying off. I'm just, I feel incredibly inspired. And Batman is just a lifelong thing for me. So it, it, it you know, it, I realize when I, when I start talking <laughs> that I'm just a kid. Right. Aren't we all when we talk about comp? Let's let's be realistic. It's 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 kid stuff. It, you know? it is right, but right. But it's, I it's would, we're I, talking about people who shoot lasers and fly to other planets. You know what I mean? Like, I'm I'm a construction worker. We were talking about this before we went live. You know, I'm 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 in a dirt trench digging with with guys that have like seven kids and their fathers fought in wars and these guys are veterans and i'm like guys i'm making my own comic book and they all just like look at me like you're the oldest one in this room and, and you're the biggest kid among us you know so yes i, I love this talk about bug you know what what an obscure but wonderful character that that you, you had a connection with and you got to draw and you know how and you worked with your brother too how cool is that yeah and we we, we... Uh, we took guitar lessons at James Ray Studios in Roseburg, Oregon, and he had a waiting room and he had a stack of comic books and New Gods Number 9 was there. And Lee would constantly be, please let us have this, let us have this. So in our little universe, Bug was the coolest thing ever and was as big as Superman or Spider-Man because, you know, it. we didn't have comic book stores. And if you didn't get a comic off the, the rack at the drugstore right you then, missed there, you missed it. Oh yeah. It, it was years before we we would find, you know, eBay or comic book stores where you could get anything and everything or I, all the collections that have happened since the 80s, you know, and I remember the I could not. This. So in our little world, Bug was it. We the, this character is introduced in this Jack Kirby comic book and it we're thinking this is the coolest thing ever. We didn't know that that was it. <laughs> that, was, <laughs> that was all it was. And then uh, until uh, Cosmic Odyssey, you know, um there were, yeah, nothing was really done with Bug. And anyway, but uh, yeah, it's weird. We all have our own little obsessions and our favorite things. And, and don't, don't you kind of miss though chasing down a comic book? Like, like I was saying that the the, the, the Michael Golden, Bill Mantle of Micronauts, the first oh, one. What a great yes. series! And I remember, like, me and my friends, like, we were in what third, fourth, fifth grade when that came. I can't remember exactly, but it was like, okay, you go to that store, you go to that store, you yeah. know. And you know, okay, I got issue eleven, I got issue nine. But damn it, we're missing number ten. And, you know, and then we would speculate on what happened on issue number ten. And then years later, somebody told us a comic book store was opening, and we were like, "No, this, that's insane. Who would ever make a store that sold just comic books?" Yeah, it changed my life. Speaking of another bug, I loved that series. That was something that Lee, yeah. Lee was way better about being there and making sure he was there when the new comics came out and stuff. That was still way over my head when I, uh, you know, I'm two, two years younger than him. And uh, so I always looked to what was in his stack. And if we went on trips and stuff, I always bought the goofy kid stuff, you know, the Harvey hot stuff and Casper, that sort of thing. Yeah. And then, and then I would rip through mine super fast, learned how to read from comic books because I wanted to what these characters were saying. And then I would, I would have ate my fast food, those comics. And then Lee had these meals you know, Legion of Superheroes and oh. and all, all the you know the great Marvel stuff and um yeah I, I tell people in third grade I was in the bottom reading group like I my the kid I shared it you know back in old days he shared a textbook because schools it so I shared a textbook with the kid who couldn't pull his pants up after he went to the bathroom oh, so right. I knew I couldn't read you know I I knew there was oh. something wrong and then my friends got me into comics and by the end of third grade I was reading in the top group. I remember I was sharing a book with Marianne, the one who tattletailed on everybody, you know? So I, and it's all because like, like I, I tell people when I went home, I didn't do math. Math was something you do in school. Reading was something you only did in school. That wasn't a, a fun, but comic books made it, 
fun and and, yeah. and it was worth looking up words. I, I remember like pellet. Steve uh, Stanley used to use the word pellet a lot in the early comics, and I didn't know what it meant. And I'm looking it up in a dictionary now, you know, and it's all from comics. Yeah, for years I thought the word puny was punny. Yeah, I've, I've never heard anybody say it out loud. So I, right. there's all these all these punny <laughs> punny humans. <laughs> These, and, and, and I remember docilence instead of adolescence. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, it, it would be so wild to like hear an adult say a word that, oh, I read that. Yeah. Now I know how you say that word. All these and, big, big words, especially if you're reading Fantastic Four, because, you know, Reed's throwing stuff out left and right. And it's like, what does that mean? Right. And, and, and Stan Lee was into science, so he would comic book eyes it but it was science like alternate dimensions and time travel and black holes these were things that was like the, the cusp of of, of com and I, I always say this to people you find something interesting like like when I, when the terminator was coming out and terminator 2 was the biggest thing that summer i was like this is the absorbing man jack kirby did this 20 years ago yeah you know, you know movies are finally catching oh. up to special effects that lived in this before that outer, outer limits <laughs> The Terminator is is right out of an Outer Limits episode. Yeah, uh, you know, I, I I just love how you face the line. The comics are are fun. You know, that's that's the bottom line. That you know, I, I I can't I can't stop. You're visiting worlds. You you know, you time travel and you you you're seeing a guy ride a dinosaur. All of this great <laughs> stuff, and yeah. it just drives me nuts when when I see a comic book and it's like the same panel, two people talking. I'm like. No, this there's no special effects budget, man. You know, this guy should be flipping around like Spider Man said crazy stuff too, but he was sticking on the ceiling, he was jumping over there. You know, well, you just you just nailed a, a very important thing because I was talking about you know uh, somebody making a film and having to build a village, also with special effects and budgets. Comic book. This is why I wish more kids could get into this, where they could um, they can read a comic book and then go over here and start making their own. Right. With, with without any need of permission, or I mean, even if you only have a crayon, right? Just you can start making your own same. You can get into your own head and start spilling it out onto paper, or or digital, or whatever kids have access to them. But I really wish, as as childlike as and and ridiculously um, adolescent as we obviously are. Yeah, real two, two adults sitting in a room full of toys <laughs> talking to each other. <laughs> I, you know, I, I spend all my time creating. I, I would like to spend more time trying to figure out the marketing side of this and figure out how do you keep this art form constantly reintroduced to new generations? Obviously, something's happening because for my entire career, I was told it's over. Comic books are dying. But they don't. They just keep powering on. And I'm still here. I'm still making comics. So somebody keeps buying them. You know, somebody. And I'm hoping that new generations are because, you know, I have kids. Do you, you know, kids read comics? They love them, but they're more musicians. They're, they, they didn't they didn't uh, uh, pick up the drawing gene, you know, so. And um, but my oldest grandson, he. You have a grandkid? We have seven grandkids. Oh my God, you look so young. <laughs> the older I get, the younger everybody looks. I'm always amazed when people have grandkids. Well, good I'm for you. Congratulations. The oldest I've, I've done paintings with him. Like I, I'll show him how to draw it out and then how to do, because I do these big pop art paintings on canvas. And so I've done that with him. And, um, and then his younger brother uh, is artistic. But also, like he uh, started taking um, classes to uh, blow glass. Wow, that's interesting. Yeah, like he's uh, he's making pipes, <laughs> <laughs> or uh, you know. <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> uh, but no, there's a there's so many things that you can make from blowing glass that I was never aware of, and and the art of it, and and. This this kid, you know, just that is, that is really interesting. That is so cool. Yeah, there's always something, but all they're all very artistic in in some way or another. And but but no one has got the comic book gene yet. Uh, they will. Well, they will sooner or later. One uh, has colored uh, several, and so and our our daughter Kelby, she also has done some coloring. 
um, but not to where they've uh, sought it out professionally. I, I got one last question I'm dying to ask you. I, I know you're a music guy and you got your Rolling Stone shirt on. What, what, are, what are bands that you like? What, what are some of your favorite musical groups? Or, or... who like the, the we, I we had an older cousin who came to live with us, Robin, and her she brought a record collection with with her, and that changed my life musically because I was introduced to the British Invasion. She had all of the you know, of course the Beatles, the Stones, the Kinks, the Who, um, Yardbirds. Oh yeah. Uh, and then, and then bands like Bad Finger, and uh, but then I I segged into the glam stuff with uh, Bowie and T Rex and Roxy Music and Mott the Hoople, yeah, Pop, Velvet Underground, um, and uh, yeah, and it's funny because those are still my absolute favorite bands, and then the newer bands uh, like the Dandy Warhols, which is a Portland band, um they would be they've consistently been my favorite contemporary band they keep plugging away and um uh because they're influenced by those bands you know that that uh black rebel motorcycle club brian jones Hell massacre um stuff like that but the dandy warhols they they uh they really carved out this very unique slice of of success for themselves i've like a they they bought a block in downtown portland when uh based on some of their music was made into commercials and um so they were able to uh form their own label and uh build off of this very loyal fan base but this block in portland they named the auditorium the odd atorium and it has the big beautiful if they had public venues there it would be the best venue in portland wow. it's not amazing this big beautiful stage and and um but they use it for their own parties and per performance and recording they have their own recording studio in there That's mixing the thing that like a little kid i'm gonna we're gonna form a band and then we're gonna make a block and we're gonna play there and have our own parties that is awesome <laughs> that is it, it's so i said this before it's so difficult in any form of entertainment to have any kind of lasting success to break through and they've been really smart about using every bit of success to building more security and with this they have the best recording studio they have a green screen studio in this space wow. they have a chef's kitchen a dining huge dining space um it, it's and offices um at the front it's just a wonderful if if on YouTube, I think it's their song "Be All Right." Um, go on YouTube and look the uh, video. Uh, uh, I, the actress's last name is Pere. I'm blanking on her name. Jessica Pere. She okay, yes. we yes, walk through, you, you walk with her in this video. She she was uh, um, Dawn's second wife on the Mad Men series. Yes, yes. And so you'll see her walk through the auditorium okay. and you see the dandies play, playing on their stage and whatnot. But I just admire so much that they created this secure space for themselves that um, it has paid them back tenfold. That is awesome. And, and that's the dream, you know, to build a creative space for yourself. I've, I've done a much smaller, much more modest version of that my um drawing board is the back row of my little movie theater here so i'm on the stage of my my little performance area here and back there uh movie theater seats and then the back row is where i work so i i, I like feeling like i'm in a movie theater working and again a much more modest humble version than what the dandy warhols have built for themselves but it's all i need you know and it's uh i got my big wall of books over here I, everything i need is here yeah, my, I, I, my... I, I bought this house and you know i'm a construction guy fixed it up and like i i never want to leave like every day i wake up to go to work i'm like i, I gotta leave this wonderful place that i, I want to invite all my friends down here and hang out play dungeons hey. and, <laughs> and that's another thing but like the, us comic book geeks you know it's always fun going to each other's house what do you got what if what what's got you excited now? You know, and you right. look at a new toy and and what and and uh, 
I'm always building things like we were talking about. And like I, I made that's uh that's astronaut Dave unplugging Hal. I, I built that that right there. Okay. Uh, I'll show you this. Can you see this? Oh, cool. That's my comic book Nancy room. Street. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's my comic book room. I show this once we start talking about spaces. I got to show my comic book room. <laughs> that's cool. Oh, look at that. So see, he's floating in there, ready to unplug Hal. Yeah, she's singing she's Daisy right now. <laughs> and then I built this. I built this too. Oh my god, that is so cool. But I put Alex from Clockwork Orange in there. Yeah. He's got a little bit of Malaco Plus that sharpens him up and makes him ready for the old ultraviolence. Uh, oh, wow. Classic Star Wars. Yeah. Yeah. With two so, big so you just came to my house and looked at my toys. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks a lot. I, I, I have another uh, uh, group talk at 830 with RJ. You're for the done fourth. with me. No. Next, next. No, no, I'm not. I can talk to you all night long, and please come back whenever you want. And I, and I love to talk with Laura too. You know, this this is so much fun. Thank you so much. This, this is where I go downstairs. <laughs> <laughs> any any chance of you coming back to to do any more stuff with Marvel? Oh heck yeah! Oh good. Yeah, I've been good. talking with Dan Slot fairly recently about. Uh, um what we might do next and wh what's on our wish list i love yeah. when you draw spider-man it's just it's the way spider-man should look Ooh, you were talking earlier about uh things we're not allowed to talk about <laughs> <laughs> but yeah I'm, I'm actually uh okay okay yeah all right i i, I almost got him ladies and gentlemen i almost got him <laughs> but, but no right now it's it's batman 24 7 and uh and how cool just, is that yeah living the life i'm in a great time with mark we're doing a signing on saturday in portland um and yeah and we've got big plans too so it's just uh you know so so much to do so little time yeah yeah i, I hear that thank that thank you anything you want to say as, as before we go anything i neglected to comic, kids yeah absolutely <laughs> my comics kid yeah try to stop me my wife's getting mad at me every day. Comics are showing up in the mail. <laughs> you know, I'm buying comics online. I'm going here buying comics, buying back issues. So, so adult adult men go down to street corners with their long trench coats, open them up, and give comics to kids. <laughs> <laughs> Expose them to comic books. Yeah, yeah ex <laughs> you want to see my thing? <laughs> Meet Ben Grimm. <laughs> But thank you. Thank you so much. And thanks, everybody yeah. in the chat for showing up. Bye-bye, yep. everybody. Thank Bye. you.